Okay, so um, hello and welcome to Match in the Dark's uh, second event in the Ignite series. Uh, I'm Brendan McEvely and I'm here with my co-director Danny Gill and three guests who I'll introduce uh, very shortly. Um, so overall, just to remind you, this, the series is kind of focused on, to a degree, on the Arts Council's Literature Project Award um, and people interested in applying for that, but generally uh, for writers or programmers or editors or creators interested in putting together kind of one-off projects essentially um, and seeking funding through any means through, I mean, the Arts Council has the, the project award, but they also have the commission award, uh, the arts grant, um, and then there is local authorities uh, who are interested in funding things. There's Creative Ireland, there are, you know, multiple sources of funders or co-funders. And there's also, I suppose, the, the wealth of festivals and literature organizations and venues, art centers around the country. So I guess uh, maybe picking up from where we, from one of the themes we touched on last week is the, the value of working, if you're an individual artist or an individual kind of creator working with other partners and um, getting other partners on board you know, if you're if you're looking to to apply to any application, you're thinking about in the early stages who you're going to work with and securing maybe letters of support, um, and working out at the outset, you know, how it will get funded, if there'll be co-funders, who's what things are your responsibility, what things are the responsibility of your funders, um, or your, sorry, of your, of your partners. So I guess that that's kind of what we're going to get into um, today. And the three people here to kind of help us unpack all of that are Sasha De Boyle, um, Simon O'Connor, and Darren Negriefa. Uh, so I'll just introduce those uh, speakers very quickly. Sasha is the director of the Courts International Festival of Literature in Galway. Uh, she left her hometown of Ballydahab for Scotland, where she lived for 10 years, uh, working for the likes of Creative Scotland, Scottish Books International, Book Week Scotland, and Scottish Book Trust, lots of books, lots of Scotland. Um, and uh, now they're back in Galway and taking the reins of Courts uh, Festival there. Um, Simon is the director of the Museum of Literature Ireland, or MALI, uh, on Stephen's Green. And prior to that, he was across the other side of the Green as curator of the Little Museum. And prior to that, he was art director on a number of magazines, including the Village Magazine, Journal of Music of Ireland, and the Dubliner Magazine. It's also a musical composer and has been in a number of musical outfits, uh, amongst them the Jimmy Cake. Uh, and then Dearne Negriefa is an Irish poet and essayist who writes in both Irish and English and her poetry collections include Clasp, Lies and most recently To Star the Dark. Um, in 2020 she published the award-winning non-fiction work A Ghost in the Throat which has gone and continues to go around the world picking up prizes and admiring readers wherever it travels. So Dearne is also the recipient of uh, the Arts Council's Literature Project Award um, and with the funds from that award she collaborated with filmmaker Tygo Sullivan and composer Linda Buckley who, uh, congratulations Linda, it was just assigned to Astana uh, or the news went out today um, and so she worked with Tyg and Linda to bring excerpts of A Ghost in the Throat to the Everyman Theatre in Cork as part of uh, the Cork Midsummer Festival and um, so it's kind of on that particular project we'll begin our focus um, and welcome Darren and thanks for joining us uh, and maybe just talk about your motivation for getting involved in that project were you were you sort of roped into it or was it your idea uh, and I know like last weekend or last couple of weeks back we spoke to Anne-Marie Nickerin about her desire to kind of keep her books alive like there's a lot of work goes into writing and, and publishing but once it's out in the world, there are, there are a number of different ways of, of keeping the thing alive. Was, was it that or was it working with other partners or working with the, other artists or what kind of what got the ball rolling on this project? Thanks, Brendan, and, and thanks so much for inviting me along to talk about this. Um, 
area, I think it's really important thing for us all to speak about openly and, and to share our experiences openly of, of particularly our experiences with applying for funding to the Arts Council and different festivals, because I think those conversations can be really enriching. Um, uh, and Anne-Marie, yeah, on that point, she is spectacular, I think, at that exact skill. And it is a skill that I think we have to develop and drive ourselves towards as artists, as writers, um, to continue the cycle of a book, to continue to bring books to readers. And, and that's something at, at different points and at different projects, I have been able to summon that energy because there is energy required in that, I think. And, and then with others due to personal circumstances, it hasn't been possible. So I've kind of seen both sides of that. And um, I think The Ghost in the Throat has been a very, very fortunate book. Um, it was published at a time where I was able to find that kind of, those kind of resources within myself to um, continue its life cycle, as Anne-Marie put it so beautifully. Um, and also um, that there were other um, bodies, that, funding bodies and, and other festivals and whatnot that really came on board and, and were spectacularly supportive. Um, before I talk about it, I think the most important thing to say is that this book, A Goes in the Throat, was published by Tramp Press and Lisa Cohen and Sarah Davis Goff were really extraordinary at the beginning of the life cycle of this book in, in helping it become the book that it was and in um, choosing how it was published, which, we're, you know, we all kind of talk about the pandemic now in past tense, but uh, I suppose it's ongoing and, and it's hard to put ourselves back to the early days of the pandemic, but The Ghost in the Throat was published in August 2020. Um, by Tram Press and it was initially to be published in April of that year so they had to make the very difficult call at the beginning of its life to hold out for a while to see imagine now looking back at it to see if the pandemic would go away was what we were all hoping <laughs> for I imagine oh my god when you think of it but um we were really lucky because the rescheduled um publication time of the book just happened by luck or by their kind of eerie um, understanding of the publishing industry to fall at a time where there was a little lull in the restrictions. So we were able to have like what we called a launch, but there were, I think, six or seven people in the bookshop. And that seemed like a really, we were really lucky to even have that at the time. So that was the world of that a ghost in the throat came into. I really wasn't sure what to even hope for with the book at the point where it was published because I knew that there would be none of the events that we were used to. There would be really nothing at that point. It would, there wouldn't be the sport of literary festivals. There wouldn't be readings and bookshops. There wouldn't be the ordinary kind of going abroad to literary festivals that all that would be gone. So I didn't know what was going to happen with this book. And we were really lucky at the beginning to have the support of Court Festival and Kenny's Bookshop. They allowed us to have an event that was broadcast online and that began to generate interest in the book. And that was hugely important. So Tram Press were hugely important at the beginning and that was hugely important. And we were so grateful for that support. And then um, I have a long running um, relationship with Cork Midsummer Festival and with its director, Lorraine May. Um, and I suppose in her role there, she has really extraordinary vision and she works with a, a fantastic team. And part of the role that she has there, as she defines it herself, would be that kind of nurturing, I think, and encouragement of various writers and artists. And so I was really fortunate to, over time, have had her eyes on my work. So she had reached out to me before um, in that capacity as the Cork Midsummer Festival in the place where I live. Um, and um, in a very kind of genuine and wholehearted way, I think she had for a while observed who I was as a writer and the kind of um, 
challenges that I face as a person, which are fairly evident, I think, to anyone <laughs> looking at the situation. So she, um, and I think every writer and every artist has their own unique and distinct, distinct challenges, and that that's a part of the role of a festival director or of a funding body is to have those kind of eyes on different individuals and different individual situations and to have that kind of brightness and generosity, empathy about oneself that allows oneself to see someone's particular situation and to see the ways in which that funding body or the festival or what have you can be of use and can facilitate the creation of new work. So Lorraine in, in 2018, Lorraine made arranged a meeting, a meeting with me and said that she was that she had seen the kind of work I was doing, that she felt like my work was very promising, and that she was considering creating a role of the artist in residence at the festival. And she invited me to, to take that on for for um uh I think 2018, 2019. Um, so basically what she was saying to me was, and, and I'm not assuming this like it was said specifically, like, you know, I see that things are very difficult for you with organizing childcare in four small children. I would like to help you. Our festival would like to help you to organize childcare. How can we help so that you have, even a few hours extra a week um, to spend on your work, um, I think like that is extraordinary. That is extraordinary for someone like me and I'm sure many, many, many other people in my position who, who a lot of their days are devoted to caring for others, whether, you know, elderly parents or whether they're trying to do full-time work outside the home and also keep an artistic practice going um, and to have someone come to you and say, specifically tailored to your situation, we would like to be useful how can we be useful was um really important and the fact that it was a two-year role um so they helped me with childcare. i think i think um uh for for each summer um the midsummer festival happens in the summer so for each summer i think there were two events that i arranged um and i created new work for both for both of those um in 2018, I wrote a suite of poems that I had been making beginnings towards already. And it was something I was really interested in. And that's important to say as well, is that the projects that I made in that role were showed the subject was chosen, defined by me. I made up the parameters. There was no pressure. Like, I mean, the deadlines that were applied were applied in a helpful way, in a structured way. And that there were regular meetings and there was the sense of someone caring. There was the sense of someone actually being interested, wanting to see, oh, where will these poems go? Where will these poems bring this project to? And the fact of there being an event that would be happening on a specific date really concentrated the mind. So that helped me to bring in the first year this, this body of poems, which was all uh, focused on the many times that, that Cork has been set on fire over the years. Um, and there was a performance in one of the buildings. It, it, it used to be a church where people took shelter from one of the city burnings. So there was this gathering of an audience in a building where people gathered to shelter from one of those fires. There was um, the recitation of the poems that I had written. Uh, Linda Buckley had composed music to, go, to accompany the poems. And Cassandra Eustace, an artist, um, who's brilliant. Um, she used charcoal to create a kind of live on glass in front of the audience, between us and the audience, to create live art that was responding to the poems in real time as well. It was really um, fruitful experience for me as an artist and like all my experience with the Midsummer Festival, it really provoked a lot of growth in me artistically as well. And what you're seeing there in the first year is the beginnings of collaborative relationships that are being nurtured and encouraged by the festival with the support of funding from the Arts Council. So that first year I was working with Linda Buckley on that project. And the second year um, I worked with Linda to write 
a whole new suite of prose poems and, and more traditionally formed poems. Um, and it was in response to, it had been 10 years since the basement of the Glucksman Gallery had been flooded. There was catastrophic flooding and that was where their um, archives and paintings were stored at the time. So um, it meant that the river completely inundated those rooms, those storage rooms, and then there had to be huge um, work done to salvage the art that could be salvaged. So I wrote poems that were in response to that. And um, Linda composed new work and we performed it again, kind of, I don't know if you could call it site specific, but in one of the rooms that flooded to um, small groups. Um, and that was really very um, artistically fruitful and, and provocative for me as well as, uh, um, as a writer. And, um, that was one of those experiences that I still think of with fondness. You know, when you're reading from your work, you're performing for your work, you glance up and you can see that there's people crying in the audience. You know, it was, it was one of those, um, it was one of those kind of projects. And I felt extremely fortunate to be working again with Linda Buckley, who's her work and mine really just gel quite naturally together. Every time we've had an opportunity to work on a project together, there's been a deepening of that relationship. Um, would, would it be fair to say, uh, Darren, that all the way along that, you know, that, that you guys are sort of left to manage the artistic aspect of it and the festival is looking after the booking, the venue, yeah. the, the marketing of the events, that you're given yeah. that kind of freedom. I just want to get to, you know, yes. to the heart of, of what what they're there to provide and yes and, and yeah and exactly it's that to turn, talk about money as well like are yeah. they the arts council funded you through the project award but prior to this they were maybe funding these projects and would you were they a co-funder on the the project award more recently or yeah so what happened then so so um, say that would have been the prior relationship with the festival, the prior relationship with this collaborator and the fact that it was funded. So they're the roots of it. And then in 2020, um, because of the situation with the ghost and the throat, I think partially and because there's this ongoing relationship um, with Cork Midsummer Festival, I had had a meeting with Lorraine May and as we were discussing it, we came up with this plan to apply for the project award to see if we would get funding to basically do what was missing so kind of painfully to me, not having the opportunity to present this book to an audience, which I still haven't really had um, live, like, uh, and, and that how, how would we go about that? So um, in kind of like, I suppose it was a grander scale from the previous projects that I had done in tandem with the festival. And um, Lorraine was extremely um, involved and so was the festival from the very beginning, from how we were filling out the forms. So like I kind of did a, a, rough, a, a rough draft of the forms, you know, the paragraphs that you fill in within the form for the project towards. And then Lorraine and two other people, as far as I remember from the team, went through it with a fine tooth comb and let me tell you I learned so much from that because they're extremely well practiced um, in seeking funding and I would really recommend that to anyone who is considering applying for the project board is especially if you're going with um, a festival or if there's another body that you're applying in tandem with to have that sense of collaboratively doing the forms because you can learn so much from that first of all it concentrates your mind about what you want to actually do yourself that's what i find anyway it's fantastic for that um and then that sense of seeing how people will break it down like you know the emphasis on 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 crossing the t's and dotting the i's was really important like things like health and safety that i would never really have considered if, if I was filling out a, a, a form say for an individual arts council bursary or something like that I wouldn't necessarily be considering that kind of thing or COVID compliance um 
these were all things that were really practical and really, really useful from the very beginning in filling out the forms. So I felt that there was great support there. And in terms of the budgeting as well, so from the, to get into the nitty gritty, like from the very start, that sense of, okay, how are we going to, if we're successful in this, how are we going to break down the budget? And that was brilliant. You know, then we, we were so delighted when we got the funding and that was to kind of when the, the, I suppose that was kind of when the work really began because like any project, the plans that we had made out um, and the budgets that we had made out when we were actually planning on doing it and when things were um, changing so fast with COVID, uh, the project had to change too. And that meant that the budgets had to change too and the plans and the venue had to change too. Originally, we were really hoping to have it in front of a live audience and that there would be two screens because our vision for it was that um, it would be like a reading I would give at a literary festival, but that it would almost create an experience like the reader might have in their imagination as well. So that it would use kind of the soundscape, which again, we worked with Linda. Has it come across yet how much of a fan of Linda Buckley mm -hmm. I am? <laughs> like all these projects, I'm like, please, can I work with Linda again? I, it's just been so important for me artistically to work with her. And, and so I was really glad that Linda could be involved. And 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 Tygo Sullivan is a filmmaker that I've <laughs> looked, I've looked up to him for a long time and really admired his work. So I had suggested to Lorraine that, that I would pitch it to him that he might be interested in joining us to contribute the visual element to it. And I was thrilled again when he agreed to this. So when we got the funding, I was so glad that um, we would have an opportunity to make it, but it was also very daunting because I had never really worked like that before. And um, there were, it wasn't like previous projects I'd done with the Midsummer where it was the support of, of the infrastructure of the Midsummer Festival was there. And I definitely felt that we had a lot of help in terms of the technical aspect. But with this, the technical teams really grew and they were substantial teams and there were a substantial number of people involved and I found that extremely daunting if I'm honest yeah, I found that, that very challenging Brendan and be, yeah as a yeah as a, as a non-professional recording artist or a non-professional it lights or light design I you know I've worked on a few events now and I'm always surprised and particularly through COVID then that the costs can add up the various yes. lines in the budget can add up absolutely and there are things that you see there at the end of your budget that you know would surprise most people that that need to go in and i suppose that then with festivals the things that if you if you go to a festival event that you kind of assume that they will cover uh, or don't think about you know they they have it all in hand that that's their job and that's and and maybe that that's a good point to come to sasha if i may to talk about um and i'll, I'll try and come back to darren um, it, it really is important to talk about the, the artistic aspect of it and I suppose that the value that a, that, a, that a partner can offer in unloading a lot of the worries and admin and marketing and technical aspects um, and, and I suppose not just festivals but any venue or, or kind of partner that, that has the, you know, the necessary expertise in, in all of these and um, so sub areas of event organizing but but sasha and um, maybe just to talk um to you about i suppose you know maybe just to continue speaking about the what you think of a festival should or could offer um in terms of partnerships like in, particularly when it comes to the project award uh, you know assuming a writer is successful in their application um, and maybe it's before that point that you're having the conversation with them um, about partnering or co-funding or offering benefits in kind. Uh, but when it gets to the point, if, if they are funded, they, I suppose they, they can bring a lot. And speaking to the writers here, you know, if you are funded, you, you do bring a lot. You bring an additional programming budget um, as well as your artistic expertise and, and time and energy to a festival or an organization or a museum's program. Um, but maybe just to, to focus on what the, the institutional partner can do um, 
can you can you kind of add to some of the the, the items that we've discussed so far sasha sure yeah um hello everyone thanks for having me um apologies if the internet is a bit shugly i am uh dialing in from australia <laughs> in the middle of the night um but yeah this uh so far uh Doreen's contributions have been really fascinating uh i we haven't worked with an artist on the project award yet um however i should say to everyone we're really keen to so <laughs> i'm delighted that this uh yeah, yeah. is taking place because um i think yeah uh festivals historically i think can especially literature festivals can be considered to be just a place where a writer who has published a book gets up and talks about that book and then people go and buy the book and really the focus is on the product and the kind of the sales channel and if you're to talk to publishers less good publishers not Trump <laughs> they would often say yeah you know that that's what this is here for the pipeline to sales um but I would say that the best literature festivals do much more than that and and personally you know at Courage we're very interested in um in in seeing what a festival can bring to the table there like how we can support artist development how we can support uh, the development of kind of the literature ecology within the country because I think Festivals are, are, you know, they're a natural meeting place, but they're also a natural place for, for those new ideas and things to kind of spring up. And you can do a lot more, you know, non-traditional things, which, you know, Danny and Brendan have done plenty of in their time as well. Um, in terms of the kind of approaches that we would take, uh, generally the projects in the last few years have focused on being quite values-led. Um, so we did some work on our organizational values a few years ago, and and anything that we do is really... Uh, trying to align with those so um, our values are diverse supportive um, inclusive and curious uh, and that's been quite nice because it gives you a bit of a guide because often you know there's so, there's so many different ideas um, and there's so many opportunities that can be hard to narrow that down um, and I might uh, speak just a little bit about um, the commission project that we did with Sean Hewitt I know Brendan you'd ask me to touch yeah, on that. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Just to explain to everyone the, the Commission Award, uh, the application is very similar. The only difference is that the uh, the kind of funding institution applies, so artists can't apply, um, but it's roughly the same amount or it had been. Um, mm -hmm. and it's 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 for a project, but all of the money must go to the artist. So yeah. this is another option, I guess. And um, the deadline has passed. So if you're thinking of beyond this, it's kind of around February. But it's again tends to run every two years, I think. Every, um, per art form, I think it runs every two years per art form. So or, or literature what, was open last year, but it was open again this year. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. It's it's kind of. I think it's in flux. It in some art forms it runs twice a year. I think it was supposed to run mm -hmm. every year. I kind of ah. been dropped for a while, so <laughs> I might be hoping it, it happens at least once a year for literature. Um, mm. But it's it's the kind of thing that a, a writer can have a conversation with festivals or institutions of all kinds about potentially applying mm. on their behalf. But yeah, if you say a bit more about the commission sure. for the show, thanks. Um, I would say that with all these projects as well, you know, there's a much longer term view in mind. I think uh, often artists are thinking about, you know, how I'm paying the bills next month, uh, which is totally fair. <laughs> um, but for an organization to come on board, thinking about it more like, you know, six months to a year in advance is much, much more feasible for us because we, we plan much further in advance um, and lining those things up uh, is really useful for future development as well because it means there's always new products on the table, new potential things on the go. Um, uh, for the commission, I guess, uh, as I said, you know, starting with our values we're really interested in commissioning work and creating space for work that was very diverse and inclusive and that was asking questions about queer history in Ireland uh, personally I was just really excited that the Irish queer archive existed um, and so was like gosh you know I'd love to do something with that space you know bear in mind that we are not the National Library of Ireland um, so I'd been ruminating on that and then when I saw the commission award existed I thought well that'd be a nice way to start that process um because yeah it, it's a bit of funding it's a foot in the door and so in the application that we put together we had to select a writer and we approached sean hewitt because um he and i had been having a conversation about how great the archive was anyway um and then i approached the national library or we approached the national library of Ar ireland together to say you know 
this one is coming up, we'd love to place a writer in the archives as an official kind of poet in residence. Um, and they were delighted because they didn't have to do any work. <laughs> so they just got to kind of take this uh, nice thing and make it happen. And um, what we applied for was money for Sean to spend a certain amount of days in the archive and then a certain amount of days drafting new work. And we commissioned 10 poems was like the end result. So that unlike say residencies or longer term projects, you do have to have a, an end product in the commission because it's the commission. Um, and then you might ask like, well, what does the festival get out of this? You're giving the National Library of Ireland a residency with a high profile poet. Um, but we got to facilitate the development of that work. And also we, over the course of two years, had events in the festival um, about the residency. So uh, in 2021, we had a kind of a, a panel event talking about writing through the archives and showcasing a variety of LGBTQ plus poets in Ireland today, poets and writers. Um, and that kind of started the conversation and then Sean's residency took place. And then this year we had an event where Sean read some of the work that he'd produced during the residency, which is absolutely beautiful and really uh, sad at times. Um, so hopefully it will make its way into print at some point. Um, but it was really lovely to see the fruit of that. And then we had other readings from a, a couple of other LGBT poets, especially other writers who work with archival materials. So we had Gail McConnell in that event and that sat really nicely. Um, and then in terms of the, the onward stuff for that, our intention was really to, to, to kickstart this, but to try and push it to become an ongoing project. Um, like most arts organizations, we tend to be scrabbling around for different pots of money wherever we can. Um, and my hope was that the National Library of Ireland would see the value <laughs> of the project and that we could continue it. And uh, they have come on board to fund uh, another residency. Uh, so we'll be doing an open call for that later in the year. And that, that, to be honest, is my ideal for that process. I think developing a project with an artist is, is fab and for specific projects it makes sense, but for this specific project, um, I think placing a writer in the queer archive, just seeing who's out there, you know, what writers are, are out there making work and what they might bring to that process of engaging with an archive. I think it's, it's really important to have that, that uh, kind of diversity of applications. So uh, more on that when I'm back from the holidays. <laughs> and and yeah. not by way of a plug, but just to say that, that that project where Sean has written an essay for Holy Show magazine, we're publishing oh, yeah. poems. so there is kind of like and I think in the way that Darren's you know initial uh, contact with Midsummer Festival it can just grow legs over time and mm -hmm. and I'm surprised Sasha you know you went to you know Gorch is a, is a is one of the biggest festivals not the biggest festival in the country it's a big institution but you're going to a major national institution it's sometimes surprising how excited the person at the other end of the line is about like yeah why not this is easy happy to facilitate um and that projects yeah. can have more than one partner or strand that from sean's point of view there was torch and then there's the museum and then there's mm -hmm. a print outlet and i think it's the nature of these you know well-funded projects that it gives the, the artist time to kind of reflect on oh, what else could we do or what who else could be on board or you know if 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 this is going to be as as big as as we're mm -hmm. making it who else might be interested in this um, yeah and i think um artists you know often can be very focused on on their specific work which is great for creating the work but then coming on board with a with a partner organization means you can really explore the scope of that and then kind of dream big rather than be like, oh, well, you know, if I just got like, you know, 500 euro to work on this one poem, then that would be grand. And you're like, actually, we think you should get eight grand, right? A bunch of poems and yeah. we should do a big event and we could do this mad stuff. And yeah, it gives, it gives, I guess it, the, the whole point is to facilitate artists to, to explore their work in, in, in bigger and, and wider and different ways. Yeah, I, it's funny. I was talking to a poet who was kind of saying that, you know, from their, their publisher, they had only ever received, you know, advances of and I think it's, it's the same for many Irish publishers even though they're Arts Council funded the advances can be quite low from poetry mm -hmm. three figures up to low four figures for mm -hmm. you know some of the the more well-known indie Irish publishers but that the she got you know a commission of 
6,000 from a local art center to produce the body mm -hmm. of work and publish it. So that is the kind of essentially the biggest advance in poetry in Ireland that I've ever heard of. And it wasn't offered <laughs> by a publisher because it wasn't pitched as an advance on sales. It was, you know, this is the money for the hours work that you're going to put into writing these new poems. So mm -hmm. I think it's the value of projects like this that just look at an artist's working time a bit differently. Mm -hmm. I just want to talk, come back to the the time the timeline that you mentioned because I think that's really important. Like the the festival, you're on the arts grant award, is that mm -hmm. correct? And the application mm -hmm. for funding for 2023 has already happened, um, mm -hmm. and so you know for for organisations under that strand, you really think you really want to be having conversations about potentially what will happen in 2024 but for example I know a lot of the or, or I suppose that depends maybe on how much your co-funding of a project might involve but mm -hmm. for artists looking for co-funding from strategically funded um, mm -hmm. institutions like the Writers Centre or Poetry Ireland or mm -hmm. venues that also apply around September that you know you might be coming to those saying I'm applying for 15 20 grand I'd like to get an extra five grand from you mm -hmm. plus this kind of input it's just to say to artists you're not kind of asking them for five grand up front you're asking them to apply for five grand from the arts mm -hmm. council for this project through a different strand so mm -hmm. it's kind of it's not as maybe it's, it's it's still a big ask but it's not as big an ask you're not asking them to just pull five grand out of, out of their pocket you're, you're getting them to come on board a proposal and that you each apply for separate amounts together but it's the value of your the, the letter from the festival to say that you know we back this writer we love this idea um have you any advice i guess for just just on and around that kind of um area of writers thinking about the timeline or about how to get yeah. how to pitch make proposals or how they should be getting in touch with festivals or what kind of conversations they should be having and when mm -hmm. um i like what you said a little bit earlier about you know how enthusiastic uh you know the receiving organization can be about receiving a, a proposal uh, and we definitely are about that stuff so you know we don't have like an open call or, or anything um but really what this is is a chance for us to expand and build on the artistic innovation commissioning side of the festival's work and uh literature in particular as i, I think you're well aware uh, brendan is um is not an art form where traditionally that commissioning and that development of new work is rolled into a festival's production um in the performing arts that stuff has a place be that within the festival for new commissions or within you know uh, companies that then come touring to the festivals there's a, there's a whole ecology there that exists and that has kind of funding roots and that doesn't quite exist with literature and so what that means is that most historically funded organizations don't have huge commissioning budgets and they're often you know the the, the arts grant applications we put in or the strategic funding applications are often for the historic activity that we've delivered which we are expecting to deliver year on year and so you're right to find that new money can be a challenge so getting in at the right time on that application uh, for a potential proposal is important and yeah I would say a year and a half in advance <laughs> would be about the right time if you want to uh, get in on on that kind of and, and and work that that additional ask into you know the organization's large uh, funding application having said that that's not always going to be feasible um, it can be quite tough and also in order to get an uplift from the arts council you have to have a, a really really strong reason for that AGF so it, it can be easier to actually go in through one of the smaller bots um, and to offer for example in kind or, or say you know if if it's for a commission or something uh, the festival could offer production and inc include the event as part of the festival program because that that money already exists as long as the production requirements aren't you know uh the moon um uh, and the same for marketing and ticketing and all those bits and pieces uh so so there there are opportunities to do it a bit later in the year as well there are also um other funding programs to just keep 
keep aware of, I think, you know, just keep an eye on different pots of money. I think most festivals, most organizations are always trying to find ways to do more. So there, there are some great places to just stay abreast of their programs. So Creative Ireland um, are doing their bits at the moment. Uh, the Decade of Centenary uh, has a whole new raft of funding and commissions that they've announced, but they haven't said how you're going to apply for them yet. Um, so some of those might be artist led. And if you're an artist who has interest in those themes, I mean, when, when we see those pots of money often, you don't have an idea built in, you know, you're like, oh gosh, what artist could we possibly ask to write about the decade of centenary? Hmm, let's have a think. But if you're a writer already working in that area and you come to an organization, you, you make our lives a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> so I'd recommend those ones. Um, and Create has a really great newsletter that lists all the funds and all the local authority funds. And they have the, the kind of artists in the community collaboration schemes and stuff as well. And that's all about to be artist led. And like, we'd love to move into that space. So I would say, yeah, work in advance, you know, come with a pitch um, and be prepared for it to be a conversation. And then, yeah, uh, keep your ear to the ground for other pots of money because I think organizations would be very grateful. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, thanks. And thanks for really practical advice there and enthusiasm. I think you're probably speaking for a lot of festivals and organizations that with the right idea at the right time. But I particularly mm -hmm. love that, that thing, you know, maybe the, the pitch is is not a, give me a yes or no here, please, straight away. Yeah. It's more, let's have a conversation. What are the themes you're interested in and how do they cross over with our values uh -huh. and the themes yeah, yeah. that we work on? And and sometimes mm -hmm. I convert, you know, I've had conversations with people that kind of go dry for a while and then, but then get picked up again when something mm -hmm. else or some other opportunity, when the stars realign. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely. And, and to have those conversations with, you know, your local authority, your local arts office, depending on the arts officer, the, you know, I, wor I work with a lot of them through the uh, national mentoring program, but Mm -hmm. My experience is that they do want to have those individual conversations with artists or get to know who uh, yeah. the professional writers in their community are and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe there are themes coming up in their program that you will raise and they'll be like, oh, you're perfect. And, and, and yeah, so exactly. Those. They're looking for ways to spend the money. And so exactly, if you can yeah. align with what yeah. you're doing already, like you are, especially like local authorities because they are always extremely overworked. <laughs> um, you're helping them out. And I would say actually that Ireland, in terms of its funding infrastructure, uh, is, is actually really well served for artist development because you have all of these different layers. You know, you have local authorities, in Creative Ireland, you have um, things like the libraries, and then you have all of the different arts council strands. Um, uh, and that is not, like, that's not the case in Scotland, for example. So uh, I would use it all. <laughs> yeah, here, here. Um, I'm going to come to Simon now, I'm conscious of time, but before I do, just, just to say that, you know, Darren, Darren mentioned about getting eyes on applications, um, and that is a part of what Match in the Dark is interested in doing and what we're funded to help you with. So for anyone submitting applications um, in this area, please do send us the application or the budget or the text that you're planning to submit or whatever you like, happy to, to read over things. Um, and, and I suppose what we're really interested in doing is maybe doing you know, some of the thinking, uh, you know, looking at your idea and who this might connect with or who is interested in, in this particular area or who is interested in community outreach at the moment um, and to try and connect you with those partners. Um, so do email us at matchinthedark at gmail.com um, I'm going to come to Simon now Simon thanks for, for hanging in there uh, and thanks Sasha um, so Molly is a museum with focus on drawing in as wide an audience as possible from a writer's perspective Simon I guess it's, it's a potential partner or commissioning entity or, or whatever you might call it um, I guess, our, to what degree are you open to pitches from writers or having conversations with writers or what is your process of idea generation um, or project generation and, and, and the timelines? Um, how, how does it work with Molly? Um, well, first of all, um, thanks Sasha, because Sasha has basically said everything that I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, 
from an organizational perspective. Um, and the most important thing, actually, um, I mean, there's a bunch of things that, and they'll just resonate with what Sasha was saying. First is um, not as many writers or artists contact us directly as you might think. Um, and we would be that institution on the other end of the phone that is really excited when an artist we're interested in comes to us with a proposal. Um, but similarly, um, we tend to, uh, I mean, it's a cliche, like the museums kind of operate slowly, um, but we tend to plan out like a year and a half to two years in advance. And that's a function of the funding systems. And um, sometimes we're able to do things without having to go via funding bodies because, you know, we're generating income elsewhere. Um, but more often than not, we need to tie it into grant applications. So, um, and we're also, I mean, we're planning exhibitions and installations like a year and a half, two years out. So kind of finding ways for really interesting projects that, that land on our doorstep, finding ways to integrate them into the timeline. It's easier if, there, if, if there's a bit of a time frame there. Um, we're, I mean, we're a museum, so we're, we're a collecting organization. And that's a big part of why we're interested in new writing, because we're also collecting the contemporary, um, as well as, I suppose, and uh, collecting the past and, and, and looking at the past. So we're really, really interested in contemporary writers all the time. I mean, all of our curatorial strategies are around um, involving contemporary artists in, in, in the literary work that we're doing. Um, we're really interested in cross-disciplinary proposals. Um, you know, if Darren and Linda arrived at the door, you know, at the door, like all of the doors would just explode open like in a movie, you know, because um, it would it would tick all of the boxes for us in a way. It's new writing and we get to collect the creation of it in a way. Um, but then we're also bringing other art forms in. So we're really interested in any projects um, like that. Um, similar to similar to Sasha, we are uh, and to court we're, we're I mean, we're a values led museum. Um, so a big part of what we're trying to do as a collecting organization is to enhance the understanding of the art form and the value of the art form and um, beyond the kind of traditional silos that it might be might have been perceived um, in the past. So and that involves really, I mean, we have a preference for working with um, uh, not exclusively, but with artists who are representing um, communities that were maybe less visible um, or underrepresented. So that's really important for us, but it's not exclusively um, a strategy either. So that's important to remember. Um, if artists come to us with proposals that can in any way connect with young people, um, we're also really interested in that because learning uh, is a really big part of what the museum does. Um, it's a big part of what a lot of organizations do uh, as well. And often, um, like Sasha mentioned around say local authorities, like they tend to be overworked and not kind of thinking, like not having as much time to come up with amazing ideas. And, um, and they may have programs where they're, you know, they're behind in, 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 in filling in slots of them, uh, you know, particularly around learning. Um, if there's anything that can, you know, a project could be say have an adult audience, but then if there's a potential learning outcome for younger audiences, that's really interesting for us um, as well. And, uh, um, we're really interested in experimentation at any scale uh, too. So, I mean, we, we involve writers in a curatorial capacity with exhibitions. Um, we have a physical public space. Uh, in a way, the most predictable thing for us to do is to have readings. Um, we're nearly more interested in that digitally because then we get to kind of record it um, and speak to kind of other audiences outside the museum. Um, but we're really interested in making exhibitions and installations with writers and with artists. Um, uh, and again, you know, that tends to take a few years to plan out and um, you have to be prepared for a long winding, uh, what we call an umbilical conversation. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the baby gets bored <laughs> eventually, uh, smiling and happy. Um, so, uh, and, and we're really into that exploratory process, actually, as well. Um, like we're nearly more afraid of the fully formed idea. Um, and, and more interested in the kind of little spark uh, of something that someone just comes to us and says, look, I have this idea, can I talk to you for 10 minutes about it? Um, and then we have a coffee or a chat and, you know, we start realizing, oh, actually, there's a, there's a funding opportunity for that. And if we were to look at it from this lens and bring in this artist into it as well, or this practitioner, then actually we could apply for that thing over there. And that's going to take a year and a half. But, you know, you start building a project then. Um, from something that's maybe just a kind of, um, I suppose, an artistic instinct uh, that comes to the door. So, 
I think I have, I think I'm incredibly guilty of thing of the long email of the fully formed idea and the <laughs> here's how it's going to work and this is what we think the budget is and these are the different things we need from you and this is how much the wine is going to cost and you know yeah. and I think you may have been on the receiving end of, of one or two <laughs> of those incredibly long emails so apologies but what you're saying I think is that yeah the conversation that that it has an opportunity to drift in lots of directions or for for you to be able to get to know that writer what their interests are and, and see where your interests align yeah. and it's also brendan as well i mean it's like from a curatorial perspective it's really valuable for um for us and for anyone in this type of situation and organization it's really valuable for us to know that these ideas are out there and what these artists are working on or what they'd like to work on and um, because we're kind of here you know we're trying to find we're trying to figure all that out we're hearing it from different people and kind of we start making connections ourselves then curatorial connections ourselves and i think actually you know this thing is happening over here and then we can tie it to this thing over there we can, you know and suddenly we start having um a program that makes sense so um i mean not every approach is going to result in something obviously um but uh, i'd still really encourage people to to make contact with organizations um because that's, I mean, like Sasha said with the NLI, like I'm not surprised that they were so receptive and so excited, you know, I mean, you would be as soon as anything like that came, came your way. If it's bringing, if it's bringing some existing funding with it, I mean, it's like, it really makes it very, very easy. A lot of the time in organizations um, like ours, where you may not have direct funding for an idea straight away, you nearly always in the, in the kind of immediate short term, you have supports that are valuable to kind of at least get the project off the ground be it through physical space we're working in um or you know like kind of like in molly we have recording facilities and things like that there's ways we can kind of make projects like make them start to roll a bit um and we sometimes think of this as a kind of a like a long form curatorial thing where we're like well look you know the idea may not be formed but why don't you come in and do like a little 20 minute podcast with us about this kind of connecting issue and then uh, and then we'll see if we can turn that into something else. And, um, you, you mentioned earlier about you're interested in making exhibitions with writers. What what does that mean in practical terms? And or maybe maybe through some examples of current and past, you could talk yeah. about. It. Yeah. So like we're. I mean, we've, yeah. Like we've involved. I mean, we. I suppose it's from a it's, it's from a public engagement perspective as well. I mean, we we would consider ourselves. Although there's a lot of artists on staff, um, thankfully, but we would consider ourselves, um, you know, museum people, right? And uh, we're you know artists in a way to us are are the real communicators. So we've always felt it was important to involve artists in the making of exhibitions, ordinarily as guest curators. And you know, I've had a lot of phone calls where I've had to really convince writers down the phone that like they're going to be able to do this and that there's a support network in the museum to help them do that and um, like we had june caldwell um curated uh, an amazing kind of video installation for us um about nula of Fuelon's memoir are you somebody and you know it was really good i was waiting on a flight and it was delayed and it was really good because it took me like an hour and a half to convince june on the phone that she was going to be like she was exactly the right person to do this and she was in the end you know and we basically spent six months you know discussing what the form of this thing would be because we just said to her we want you to help us make an exhibition about the impact of the book that was it mm -hmm. um, and it was all june's work then where she developed it into this thing that was about testimony and then we have a technical team that's like okay well you know start imagining in your wildest dreams what's that what that's going to look like and then we can start turning it into something that's that's real um, we're in the middle of a project with Claire Louise Bennett at the moment, which is actually a, a writing commission, but that is going to take the form of some kind of installation in the museum um, where people will be able to go in and listen to it. So um, it's interesting because we're like we're a museum of an art form. Um, but as we the more we uh, the more we run this museum, the more we realize that we're a museum of the value of the art form um, and that a lot of what our job is about is kind of encouraging people to, to, to realize the value of the art form. I mean, they go home and read the books. They don't come into the museum to read. Um, and we're not really that interested in showing them the material history of the art form. Like here's the note, here's, you know, here's, here's a notebook or here's the artist. 
slippers, you know, like that's that's not what it's about for us. The thing is in flux and um and it's and the art form is is, is never more relevant than in the contemporary sense. So that's uh yeah, I mean that's that that informs a lot of our thinking around the kinds of exhibitions we want to make. I think the exhibitions, in a way, are probably more leaning to being artworks in and of themselves, and um, that are involving writers in the creation of them. Um, yeah, thank you. Just thank you so much for to you, Simon, for being so generous and inviting. I guess of, and I hope it's okay for me to say your and and equally, Sasha. Uh, your email addresses is, is would that be fair to do it's simon at molly.ie and sasha at court.ie um, and we're at match in the dark at gmail.com and um, it's it's really encouraging i hope for the writers on the call to hear how enthused you are about starting conversation with, with the writers and that writers i hope at the end of this should feel that they have a lot of value to offer um, institutions institutions that you know like like the like the one we run and i run the holy show and others that wouldn't exist without you you know um and it's great to hear you put the kind of the focus on on writers ideas and uh putting them at the center of exhibition creation things like that it's really great to hear um and Darren, from your own experience with midsummer festival sound like lorraine sounds wonderful um uh so yeah it's, i and I, if, if anyone on the call wants to has an, another institution in mind that they think they'd like to approach or have ideas about partners or vague ideas about the, the kind of partner they might like to get on board and uh, myself and danny gill would really love to have a conversation with you about um who that might be and if we'd love to make suggestions or help in any way we can if we can uh the baby is screaming in the background. I don't know if you can hear that. I'll just go in and see to that. And thank you so much for your time. And uh, thank you to all the writers on the call and programmers as well. Um, thanks, Darren, Sasha, and Simon. And we'll see you again in two weeks' time where we'll be focusing on print projects. So if you're involved in thinking of a print project of any kind, uh, do join us. Um, so we'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, everybody. See you guys.